wired into technology transformation. This is the Digital Bulletin Podcast. Welcome to the Digital Bulletin Podcast. True to our tagline, we're all about inspiring technology leaders. Now that's in terms of what we try to do, but it's mainly about the people we meet. Today we're here to talk about the technological transformation of the media. That's in all its forms, everything from movies and MP3s, a bit like the one you're listening to right now, or from academic libraries to full-on live sports. The business of making media has never been busier. Cords have been resolutely cut all around the world, and we are surrounded by a massive plurality of internet-based content services. They're competing for our attention, they're in our pockets, they're in our smart TVs, and all we need to do is ask our friendly neighbourhood conversational AI to turn them on for us. With all that has come a seismic shift in the media business itself. That's in terms of both the sheer volume of content that media businesses need to create, as well as all the places that it needs to go to once they've made it. Add to that the almost limitless opportunities that digital offers from personalization to monetization and interactivity. And the media supply chain of today is a totally different beast altogether. And it's one that is increasingly to be found in the cloud. It all makes for a fascinating conversation and I'm very happy to say we're joined on the Digital Bulletin podcast today by three people who are very well positioned to talk about it. Vichusa is a multinational leader in digital transformation and has worked with some of the biggest media players in the world to re-engineer their operations into the cloud. And from Vichusa, we welcome the head of their media business, Frank Palermo, and technology evangelist, Surajit Bhattacharji. But Fatusa couldn't do any of what they do without the incredibly close partnerships they have in the industry, one of which is AWS. Now, Ian McPherson joins us today as well. He is AWS's global strategy leader for media and entertainment, and uh, he's here as well today. Welcome aboard. Now, Frank, if I may start with you, give us a very quick summary. I know you've uh, witnessed much of this yourself, a very quick summary of how the media business has changed over the last 10 years or so, um, in particular in terms of the how media is created and how it's distributed? Certainly. You know, we've seen a lot of changes over the past 15 years. I mean, if you think of industry-wide, no other industry has gone through this amount of change and, and disruption. If you just think about the digitization that's happened across all sub-segments, I, I, I reflect on things like publishing, right, that started from you know, selling books in stores to online distribution, now to digital distribution through Kindles and other e-readers. You think about how we've consumed, you know, movies and, and series from more linear programming to, you know, streaming to now, you know, mobile on the go. You know, we all remember how the blockbuster story ended. Um, newspapers have been completely disrupted, you know, making a move to online to making a move now to figure out what is the future of this kind of print publication and, and syndication. Um, advertising has completely changed over this period. You've seen, you know, the move from traditional advertising to much more, you know, programmatic and AI based advertising. Uh, we've seen shifts in, in the music industry, right, from you know, going to physical record stores, to an online app store, to a full service streaming capability, right? Consumers now shifting from, you know, having the need to own music to being very comfortable to rent or lease it, right? Sports, you know, from, uh, you know, just an in-person experience is now a completely virtual and and on-demand experience if you want it to be, right? Today, you're seeing more fans experiencing uh, you know, arena sports outside the arena, right? So with products like online league passes and, you know, just the global distribution now that sports have, uh, uh, you know, across over, you know, 200 countries, 30 different languages. It's really a global um, in, environment now. And and you're seeing new content types um, really um, b- become more mainstream. You know, the whole video revolution now, right? First with what I call long form video and in platforms like YouTube to the more short term phenomenon that TikTok have, you know, brought us now, which has really completely rewired 
almost everything we do, right? How we learn, how we engage in content, right? And, uh, you know, like we're doing here, podcasts have come, become the new radio stations, right? With really kind of micro programming and micro topics and, you know, high degree of personalization. There's literally thousands and thousands of different topics you can engage on. So, you know, if I think about what is the common fabric of all of these changes over these last 15 years, in my mind, it's really been about the cloud, right? I think a lot of the underpinnings that have uh, formed many of these transformations, it's all been about this, you know, computing platform that now has enabled global reach, is elastic in its in its capabilities, um, is high performing, has really enabled this, you know, high, high performance streaming. It has enabled kind of full production workloads and supply chains now to move into the cloud. It has na- enabled the kind of launch of new digital products and digital content. Uh, and I think it's a really exciting place to be. And, you know, we were fortunate to have really, uh, uh, you know, run into AWS very early in their life cycle and, and really partnered with them. And it's been a great journey you know, it's 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 without a doubt one of the richest platforms out there, and um, you know it's it, it's been instrumental and material in, in in the work we've done in transforming clients, our clients, uh, you know, entire uh, supply chain. Great, and um, Suraj, if I could ask you to define one term for us, perhaps people who are a bit more like me than than like you, when we talk about media supply chains, what what is that? What's the definition of that? And and how do you, what how has the cloud really transformed that? Frank just touched on it, but define that for us. Sure. So um, I'll first start with the definition, right? So when you think about media, you are consuming content in some form, right? Whether it's video or audio or even you know print, it's still around, right? So the way we think about the supply chain, and I think it's true for the broader industry, is to think about the entire content life cycle, right? So if you think about, you know, conceptualizing content to production, to post-production, to distribution, if you think about that entire life cycle, right? And then you imagine the resources, the systems, and the processes that are involved in, you know, managing that. That's what, you know, the supply chain is really. Uh, So, you know, a simple way to think of it is resources, systems, processes involved in creating, managing, and delivering the content in various forms that we consume. Uh, that makes up the supply chain. So um, in, in terms of really uh, how cloud has impacted, uh, I'd like to just take a step back and just talk about uh, the transformation that has happened, right? Uh, for a second before I jump into a, how the cloud is relevant. Uh, so Frank talked about how we consume a lot of content these days and there is no dearth of platforms that we can consume them on, right? Um, so what that has led to is a significant increase in the volume of content that gets created. Now, whether it is the Netflix and the Amazon Primes and the Hulus of the world, the popular OTTs, which are household names, or whether it's traditional media companies, there is a significant uptick of content that gets produced. So if you now think about the supply chain, you're thinking about, needing to support higher volumes. And when you talk about supporting higher volumes, there is a cost associated with supporting high volumes. And that cost cannot grow exponentially or even linearly given where things are. You know, otherwise, it would actually make business untenable for some of the traditional media players. So there has to be a play for efficiency. So while there is a significant increase in volume and the need to process that volume, there is an expectation going in that we will be able to process that high volume at much more uh, higher levels of efficiency, so to speak, right? And then we are all living in the world of AI, right? So there is an expectation uh, in general, right? And also specifically within media that you know, there's going to be a lot of innovation, right? Things are going to become possible that were not possible in the past, right? So uh, in terms of expectations, the market forces are driving volume. There's an expectation of being able to process volume more efficiently. And there's also an expectation of doing things that were not possible in the past because of the advent of AI. Now, 
the cloud has a significant role to play across all of those three dimensions. If you think about volume, you know, the ability to go ahead and scale up and down, that's what cloud brings in in the form of elasticity, right? So you don't have to go ahead and plan for your target, you know, volume and plan a large infrastructure estate to be able to process that volume, right? Um, so the cloud gives you that elasticity. In terms of efficiency, again, you are going to use the resources on a you know, pay for use basis. So uh, you, there's inherent efficiency in that model. Uh, you know, at the same time, if you think about the workloads that make up the supply chain, uh, you know, there's a significant fluctuation of that over a period of time, right? Um, you know, you suddenly might have a, in, an influx of content that has come from production and you need to do post-production and distribution, and then you might idle for it, you know, for, for many hours after that, right? So that way, the workload really lends itself well to an elastic model, both from a volume and efficiency perspective. And then on the innovation dimension, uh, there are a lot of cool solutions which cloud providers, uh, you know, and I would say AWS is leading the charge on that, um, that, that are available for uh, things like uh, auto-dubbing of content, auto-captioning of content, uh, and things like uh, deep video search, extracting metadata at a scene level within the videos, and then be able to use that for um, you know, creating new content. Um, so, so that's how uh, I think you know, the, the market has changed and in line with that, the cloud has a very important role to uh, help businesses adapt to the change and remain viable for the longer haul. Awesome. So we'll have a look at uh, some more details there in terms of the opportunities that are present for for media companies. But Ian, if I could come to you from AWS's perspective, obviously AWS is really the progenitor, the, the genesis, the creator of cloud even as a, as a thing. And um, what can you tell us from your perspective in terms of the journey that the media uh, industry, I suppose, as a whole has been on? So thanks for asking. Uh, I've been at AWS for about eight and a half years and I've worked in the media and entertainment space the whole time. And it's been a remarkable journey um, from the beginnings at which we were trying to convince people you could safely store a backup copy of a mezzanine file in the cloud to one today where we see major motion pictures made almost entirely in the cloud where large global events are broadcast from the cloud where companies store entire film libraries to go and localize and distribute content from the cloud so you know that journey has been a remarkable one to see unfold and i think if there's an underpinning to a lot of this, because I agree with everything that Serge and Frank said in terms of the trends, it's that companies realize the value of data as it relates to their, their media business. And that data could involve metadata, as Serge was talking about, that describes what's in content to make it more searchable, to do better targeting of content to different people, and to build that data profile of not only their business and their customers, but their media operations so that you find those efficiencies. Because yes, at the end of the day, if you're a major studio and you have to make 400 different versions of that new feature film to be distributed throughout the world, uh, you're only gonna be able to do that if you have the efficiencies you gain be because you have one, the data, and two, on-demand resources that you can capitalize on to increase that velocity um, in, in volume. Great, so the um, what, what, what would you say where would you say we're at in terms of the market? So this is a very fast moving world. And what are the threats and opportunities that current media businesses have? And, and how mature would you say that the industry is as a whole? I would say we are uh, a late stage teenager. How about that? <laughs> you know, we've gotten our car, we've gotten our driver's license and we have some freedom to go and explore. But, you know, we're we're still in the formative years. Um, so I, I think in general, when I look at the, what the market is doing, uh, we see the ability to, to distribute content all over the world. So all of a sudden the content owner can find new outlets and new ways to monetize even their legacy content. So people who've got these large archives of historical content or episodic content are now saying, well, boy, if I bring this into the cloud and I 
bring this up to currency, make this localized for the different languages and different platforms, I could resell this content and find new life and find new value there. I can also look at the cloud as a way to do really innovative things. And so when we talk about the fundamentals of why cloud is important, you know, when we are looking even at the core IT world, experimentation is key. And the be able to rapidly experiment, not have delays for provisioning equipment or procuring equipment, but being able to stand up environments, run your workloads, test, evaluate, and iterate on those things very quickly are the core fundamentals of really cloud de design and development. And we can apply that to the media business. And we can see where people are now are experimenting with live remote production for sports events, bringing in data from the cars in an F1 race to give customers a new experience and understanding of the game and the race. And then spinning all those things down and making them go away so you're not paying for anything when the, when the event's over. When you look at an event like the Olympics, I'm, I'm still in awe of the fact that now there are so many of these pop-up channels that you can watch a specific country's athletes in a given sport on a very small venue in a remote place in the world and watch the entire event because you're a fan of fencing or you're a fan of dressage or whatever that event is. What a remarkable experience that is for customers and consumers. Absolutely. I, I remember personally tuning in to bad I've got a thing about I play badminton and many many people don't but I was able to watch that and it's it's and just re-educate myself about just how bad I actually am at it um and that's not an opportunity that I remember having before but um Frank we, we we've touched upon innovation so what is the difference from obviously you work you spend a lot of time with clients who are perhaps sensing that both the opportunity and the threat that they have as a media company is to make sure that they're innovating uh, enough um, that they don't get left behind it's not necessarily a case that media companies aren't embracing the cloud yet um, I think they probably are it's about how they're using it and how efficient they're being but from your perspective what would you say are the the real opportunities for innovation that exist for, for media companies now with the cloud yeah, I think what Ian was saying around data really is is how these businesses are are reorienting their their entire strategies. I mean, if you you know, as I opened with, there's a lot of progress that's been made. So, you know, we're clearly we're still in those formidable teenage years, but I but I I think there's still a lot of change happening. Right, as as these businesses are rewiring, you just think about the linear space. I mean, over the last decade, they've probably lost about forty percent of their overall subscription revenue right through due to the over the top players and streamers that are now emerged but those um continue to evolve right so new new uh new models of are, are are coming you're seeing fast platforms now which are the free ad supported streaming platforms because even the streaming businesses now are starting to reach an interesting plateau of subscribers you're seeing a lot of entrants now it's no longer two or three you know, platform game, almost every content provider has now got a, has a streaming, you know, offer and platform. And so you're, you're starting to see some bundling and consolidation happen there, you know, with Paramount, looking at their Paramount Plus and Showtime, you're seeing Warner now planning to merge HBO Max and Discovery. You're seeing some of the large traditional companies like a Comcast, like a Charter, like a Cox, right? How, how do they still remain viable? Are they looking at mergers and acquisitions, companies like Roku and Vizio, are they now going to come into the portfolio? Uh, so you're seeing a lot of changes still in the whole, um, I would say, content and, and, and uh, you know, entertainment space. And I think the, the winners of this race are, you know, able to continue to make investments in, in content, although I think there's a shift more to quality than quantity. You're seeing the houses still pour a lot into creation. Um, but you've almost reached a saturation point, right? It's the old, you know, there's 57 channels on and nothing on, right? How do you begin to actually engage? And so this is where the data and personalization becomes very important and how you can apply AI ML techniques to really, um, you, you know, create that real intimate, um, you know, experience um, on, on one dimension. Um, so yeah, I, I think data is at the heart of, of personalization and, and really, understanding um you know how to compete there in in terms of engagement great so, um, Sergio, if i can ask you something that obviously my own personal experience is more on the 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 
the front end, I was going to say, but the production end of things. So less on uh, actually making things. One of the things that I think was interesting that was mentioned there is where we have that end of the supply chain, the actual production of of content itself and how cloud can uh, play a role in that. What what can you tell us about the, the opportunities that may be beginning to present themselves there for media production companies? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so when it comes to production, right, uh, media companies, at least the traditional ones, have a lot of investment in uh, studios and then equipment. And basically, uh, coming out of that, there's a lot of editing that happens on premise. And uh, what we are starting to increasingly see is, and Ian touched on that, is more and more content is now getting produced on the cloud. So there's certain types of content which you know involve a lot of um, special effects and animation for which tools are already available to produce that kind of content on the cloud and not produce and do all the editing and stuff. Now, you know, when it comes to uh, you know getting content into the cloud um, from a set, that's where I think. 5G ultra wideband and emerging Wi-Fi standards are going to be allow. They're going to allow content to be pushed into the cloud straight from the studio set. Um, you know, and you know you're going to then be able to do post production and other customizations to the content on the cloud without incurring significant egress cost, right? Um, because once you you put the content on the cloud, you're going to you know be uh, it's going to make sense only if you do a lot of the subsequent processing and distribution out of the cloud, because the moment you take content out of the cloud, you incur egress costs, and these are you know, large files we're talking about. Uh, in terms of um, you know, really post-production, if I can just touch on the innovation piece that Frank was talking about, um, you know, media companies have been using you know, automated quality control and captioning solutions um, you know, for a long time. But what we are starting to see now is experimenting with things which are a little more complicated, you know, especially uh, given how easy it is to experiment, right? Ian talked about you know, we need to experiment and fail fast. So there are solutions on the cloud, including AWS, for automated translation and auto-dubbing. Now, these seem to be simplistic you know, on the surface, but then if you go deeper, there's a lot of complexity involved there. So for example, if you are auto-dubbing, you have to do translation, and then you have to convert that into speech, and then you need to be able to synchronize that onto the video. So for something which is a documentary, that's a single track sound, you don't have that synchronization issue as much as if you were to do that for a multi-track say, episode of a drama. So that's where uh, some complexity comes in. But again, uh, there's a lot of innovation that's being uh, in a facilitated by the cloud. You know, so a lot of innovative companies will come up with you know, deep fake technologies, which allow you to synchronize you know, your lip movements with the audio and superimpose that on top of the rest of the scene. So... I, it's, it's really exciting what you know how fast this is happening and what the possibilities are, right? And without the client cloud, and especially in a uh, such a mature provider as AWS, I don't think a fraction of that would have been possible. In what kind of um, objections might people have, if you think uh, of of all the people that you deal with, um, what? Uh, and I think these perceptions are probably rather out of date, but if there are laggards, if you like, still, um, what might be the worries that they're having and what are the reasons why they shouldn't be worrying about them? Well, I think one of the ones that comes up most frequently is these are creative processes and these are people who are well-versed in using certain tools to drive very precise outcomes, whether it be editors or sound mixers or color grading these are folks who've used these tools forever. And so when we talk about moving to the cloud and we talk about the value of having applications and content reside in the cloud and bringing scalable compute to those things, they don't want their creative processes to change. So they want their editing bay and the toggle to work just like it did when they were sitting on a, in a workstation. And so we've spent a lot of time and we only 
really can do this because we've got a partner network who has matured in their ability to use the cloud to deliver those experiences in the same way they existed. But I think we start with that viewpoint that we're, we don't want to go ask people who are in the creative process to change the way they do things. They want, we want them to do this the same way. It's just that the content will live someplace else, which is the cloud, which kind of takes us to the next point, which is to say, you need an ecosystem of companies whose technologies have been optimized for cloud. So it's not simply taking what you did 10 years ago in the development and turning that into a cloud formation template. It's that you have a transformation and you start thinking about what it means to use containers in your development and you're using serverless for automation and you're using things you know, that allow you to fully embrace the scalability and on-demand resources of the cloud. And I will call out Virtusa for being one of those companies who's really helped to enable our ecosystem of ISVs and, and application vendors to be more cloud native and to work properly in the cloud. So, you know, those are, those are the ones that come up frequently. I think that, you know, there's also people who there's fear of change. And, and so if you're coming to somebody and saying, we want you to think differently about your, your broadcast operations, they may be a few years from retirement saying, well, gee, that might be not the project that I want to take on right now. But when you look at the value of being able to launch things like fast channels and complement your existing linear business with new innovative services and offerings that are going to engage customers and, and bring more eyeballs to you, uh, you know, the cloud is the, is a is a key cornerstone to front enabling technology. And so, you know, ultimately, I think people realize the value that they receive is greater than the concerns that they have. I do have a perspective. It's primarily around, I mean, situations where we have seen clients still running on-prem, they're worried that their solution is not architected or it's a third-party solution which is not architected for efficiency on the cloud. And they're waiting for their partner to provide that solution that's native to the cloud and can run at an optimal cost point. Or waiting for investments to actually re-architect their own solution uh, till they can they think that it makes sense to move to the cloud. Yeah, just to build on that, I mean, I, I think some of what you're saying is this recognition that, you know, the early, you know, uh, you know, migration to the cloud was not necessarily done with a lot of, uh, you know, re-engineering of these applications. And I think one of the, you know, uh, uh, situations there is that the cost of actually running these while initially what was beneficial as data centers were shut down, uh, but this next generation of uh, what I'll call cost optimization is going to come by re-architecting many of these applications and platforms. And so I think that's creating another opportunity for companies like us to help uh, organizations. But, um, you know, I, I, I think there's also a lot of, uh, you know, costs potentially associated with that to, to, re to do this re-platforming and re-architecture. So that, that I think is a sometimes a business case that still has to be built for, for many companies, yeah. It is a good point. The, the continuous optimization for both performance and costs is, is one of those things that really is a requirement for moving to a DevOps kind of world where you're actually managing cloud resources instead of actually managing the infrastructure physically. And so your, your discipline around that and the people you work with by extension, your partners, ability to continue to provide those enhancements and the continual improvement around the performance of an application as it relates to cloud, the cost of running that application are really fundamentals that we want to make sure that all our partners understand and that we're imparting best practices. The, the actual implementation or the building of that discipline often requires the expertise of people like Virtusa. Absolutely. In terms of value that they found, it would be great to uh, uh, hear a bit more frontline anecdotal evidence, I guess, uh, from you uh, in terms of the the work that you might have done, including together AWS and Virtusa. So, um, Frank, are there any examples that, without naming names necessarily, any examples of really work that you're quite proud of out there? Yeah, you know, there's a lot. We talked a lot about content distribution here during during this the podcast here, and I, I think one of the challenges in distributing global content, I think about a, a global uh, you know, sports broadcaster that really had to quickly get 
a lot of their video content out to various regions, different countries. And a lot of this editing would happen fairly manually, as Ian is describing. But being able to create a fully cloud-based, ML-powered uh, kind of video processing service, right, that would really be able to quickly go in and classify, say, different you know, frames and segments of, of a recorded sporting event so that you can take a, you know, three hour match down to a 20 minute short form video that really has the highlights, highlight reels or, or, or the replay reels. And being able to do that at scale by creating, um, you know, the, the certain models here, which would be looking at, you know, repeatable patterns in a broadcast, right? These could be camera angles, these could be player reactions, these could be, you know, breaks to overhead shots and, you know, getting this this proper classification uh, scheme and then using AWS recognition uh, and custom label service and developing an entire pipeline to automate it. I mean, this is can take down the uh, time to distribute and, and process this from, you know, hours and hours down to, to, to minutes, literally, and being able then to, you know, auto, uh, you know, translate that into, say, 20 different languages. And really, um, uh, you know, I think AWS has done an amazing job in some of the services that they have, you know, now, uh, you know, brought to market. And think about AWS Elemental Services, their Media Connect, Media Store, packaging, um, working with, you know, CloudFront. Um, it really creates a, a an end-to-end -end solution that I think on the content side is, um, you, you know, really becoming state-of-the-art in terms of distribution of, of these kind of real live events where you don't have the time necessarily to do a lot of post-production editing because the relevancy of the content diminishes, right, over over time. So it's a real speed to market here to get this out to the endpoint. Right. Surajit, so, so are there any uh, moments, events, uh Customers that you, you that you can think of that you're particularly proud of over the last year or so? Yeah, so um, there's one specific uh, anecdote that keeps uh, coming up in our internal conversations in terms of how far cloud can go in terms of uh, making it efficient, right? So we have this media customer in the US. Their content gets distributed to international markets as well. Uh, they are, or if not, they you know, some of their channels are household names. So what they had was a reporting solution for their business teams to look at how revenue split up between domestic versus international and then, you know, slice and dice it further based on the channels they own and operate. And then also look at competitions um, in a revenue projections based on intelligence they were able to get, right? So now this solution, granted it's not front and center in the supply chain, but it enables a lot of critical decision-making for the business teams. Now, this solution, we re-architected it on the cloud using serverless, and Ian just touched upon that. And the cost of running that solution came down to the cost of a Starbucks coffee uh, a day. So you are paying like three bucks a day, it's about less than a hundred bucks a month to be able to run that solution on the cloud. Um, so it's, it's amazing how much, you know, Cloud can impact your, your efficiency uh, levels. And then in terms of uh, really making a, a difference on the innovation side, we used AWS recognition, Frank touched upon it, to do deep video mining and extract metadata at the, at the scene level, right? Now, while you use AI to do that kind of stuff, you also have to deal with the repercussions of getting a lot of metadata thrown at you, right? So they're being able to interpret that, you know, building routines and logic to be able to get rid of noise, you know, and pick up the signal and then surface that on a, you know, search interface that's still approachable by humans. Uh, you know, that was a pretty cool experience we had. And what that enabled from a business perspective was looking at your, archived content and then being able to pick up scenes and be able to repurpose that into new content that you're creating. And it doesn't lend itself in, to all forms of content, but there's certain types of content like documentaries and historical footage where you know you could reuse that um, endlessly. Right, Ian, I'll just finally come to you. I, I think I, I, I worry that maybe your your perspective is slightly too wide to, to want to pull out individual examples. Um, 
But what what do you what can you um, give us anecdote wise? Sure, I, you know we just completed the Oscars the other this recently, and you you know kind of look at some of the films and you kind of marvel. And we've come to just accept the fact these amazing worlds are created out of nothing, and and now characters are set in them, and we completely believe that you know Avatar: The Way of Water is a real world. But when you look at under the covers of what it took to make Avatar, um, it's, a, it's an amazing technical, technological feat. Credit to all the people who worked on that, you know, Weta and, you know, all the way up to Jim Cameron and, the, you know, the vision for this. But you see that, you know, when they were building this, they would do about 500 iterations per shot. And each of which of those shots contained thousands of images. So it took 8,000 thread hours to render each frame of that movie. And essentially the combined power of 3,000 CPUs in the cloud for one hour. So just the um, sheer volume of compute resources that were required to make that movie, it couldn't have been made any other way. So historically, when you were building visual effects, you created render farms and you had a, a fleet of computers waiting there to run jobs. And you had a capacity limit and you could only do as much as that capacity would allow. And so, you know, a project like this would take years. I mean, just, just doing the individual shot might take months. So this notion that you could take this amount of data, combine it to render a given image for one frame and do this in an hour um, is, is truly phenomenal. So I hope that gives you a very specific reference for what we're talking about in terms of transformation. Yes, and uh, mentioning the Oscars is a, is a good point because obviously um, Avatar is not the only film. I, I remember Terminator 2, which was many, many, many years ago, before any of this, and, and reading about just the sheer scale of effort that went into developing entirely new forms of software just to make that happen and where we've gone from that moment to this where the same scale of an adventure and innovation is happening but now it can happen at a speed that isn't going to see you in a retirement home by the time your project goes to air so it's it's a fantastically exciting time to exist in the media industry i think and you know when we talked about maturity i think when we're seeing and what i can see coming and what we're seeing now in the next evolution of that maturity is really that combination of video gaming and movies, right? So we have things like the Unreal Engine for game rendering environments where you can create photorealistic environments to put people in, the actors, and you can have virtual sets, you know, these, these LED boxes essentially that they put a character in where it surrounds them with that environment. And now you've, not only have you done this and in, in created this world it, where you would see it in post-production, you're seeing it in the actual context of the actor interacting with their environment. So that blending of the technology that we see for video gaming and what we're historically used to making in film is gonna change a lot of what's possible. And we're just gonna see more of those worlds and wonder created. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Ian here. I, I think, you know, this whole lot, this what I call blurring of the lines, right, between the things we watch and consume and the kind of things we pl play and bed and engage in, right? There's a huge convergence that's happening here. And, uh, you know, these are incredible brands that have been built on the on the studio side. You just think of things, you know, uh, Game of Thrones or a Disney or a Star Wars and this opportunity to, to turn these into real immersive environments that are that are uh, much more interactive than, than they are today, I think is just an incredible opportunity. And you start to maybe pick up from where NFTs kind of lost some of their luster and start to reintegrate them into these immersive environments. I think that's really this next generation that Ian's referring to. And I also think it's uh, there's opportunities where you're seeing a lot of what I call dynamic content, right? These kind of experiments around you create a, a, a long form movie, but it has four or five different endings, right? And depending upon the way you interact with it, right, actually determines the way the story ends, which I think is very, very interesting way to, to think about the future, future experiences here. But I definitely agree that this, uh, 
you know, uh, lines of blurring, you know, between gaming and, 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 and interacting with uh, content for sure. Is this, um, oh, sorry, Surajit, I was about to come to you and I was about to put it to you that we might be um, stepping dangerously close to the fireplace terminology of metaverse is i mean where where do you uh, where do you see you know the this this sort of thing evolving over time yeah um so uh, before i go into the metaverse i just wanted to uh, react to what ian and frank mentioned right in terms of um you know really the virtual and the, and the real world blending right i think uh, ian was referring to this led box right so essentially uh, I think earlier in the conversation, you know, Ian had mentioned that what artists don't want is for technology to go and interfere in the creative process, right? So, so essentially, since we were hit by the pandemic, a lot of the production uh, has moved towards virtual production, right? Now, that's not possible in every case, but even where you are simulating a background uh, using a very large LED screen, What's happening is this LED box, the light box that Ian was talking about, that actually you know, lights up with scenes that help the actor in, in a deliver emotions more realistically. So those scenes on the LED wall actually are scenes that the actor is supposed to react to. So whether it's you know, space and earth uh, you know, in the movie Gravity uh, or it's something else in a different context. So technology is actually even in the virtual setup, right? Or remote uh, production or virtual production. Technology is actually enabling the artists to uh, remain true to the creative process. Um, now coming to you, your question around metaverse. Uh, you see, we saw, um, I think, and, and Frank can keep me honest here. I think about a year and a half, we saw a significant uptick in interest in, across our client base in terms of the metaverse. And specifically, we saw use cases which were around, um, you know, enabling virtual concerts. If you're a music artist and you want to do a virtual concert and, you know, media houses were worried about getting disintermediated from uh, the equation by artists going ahead and using third-party platforms, uh, gaming platforms, such as the one used by Fortnite and launching their own virtual concerts. And uh, so... There's a lot of interest uh, still in media businesses. I'd say more on the music side to be able to explore that technology and be able to offer things like virtual concerts. I don't think that's going away. However, given uh, you know the environment we are currently living in, uh, you know there with the NFT crash and all of that, uh, you know there's a little bit of hesitation. I'd say to explore that technology with as much enthusiasm as what we saw a uh, year, year and a half back. Um, there are also conversations we are having with, um, you know, networks who produce their content or, or, you know, licensed content distribute in terms of trying to figure out what's the right use case for them. Does the metaverse have a meaningful use case for them? And we're still, you know, exploring different angles there, um, but that's still remains to be defined. I'd say the case is a little more clear on uh, the music side, you know, in the form of virtual concerts. One one thing that that occurs to me, obviously, and the, and uh, but I'm not expert, so feel free to tell me if I'm being silly. But one of the the strategic choke points, I suppose, as we have, in, you know, an increasing ability to move quickly and at scale on one end of the media production supply chain and we've got um, this vast array of uh, distribution endpoints if you like for that content one of the choke points though seems to me to be the creative capacity that might exist within content creation companies themselves and perhaps one answer for that problem is um, the distribution of the creative process as well. And when we've been talking about video games, and I've got kids who play things like Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft and um, particularly new, interesting, um, uh, very community-driven things with uh, VR gaming and so on, where a lot of the time what you'll take is a brand, an idea, a world, um, 
and the users themselves are creating the narratives inside. You can see that in particular with Roblox, with Roblox, with younger kids who are, they'll you know they'll go in there uh, with a controller and just navigate their way through a linear story. It just they happen to be physically moving through it. I wonder if you think that that might be an opportunity that where instead of building beginning, middle, end coherent narratives, we, we start to see media organizations constructing universes in which other people can create the stories. I think you're seeing it now. I mean, you know, I, I think, you know, to Serge's point, a lot of the early interest in metaverse was a lot of what if and how to think about monetizing these environments. But I think very rapidly enterprises discovered that th there's a lot that's needed to take their current infrastructure and, and, and creative processes, even if those are all now cloud native, but to move them from that environment into something that's more of this kind of dynamic creation um, sandbox env environment is is a, is a is a next generation I think progression for them. But I, I think now these platforms you mentioned Roblox, I think the sandbox, you know, MetaHero, uh, many of these have now evolved, and and you're seeing them start to get uh, you know backed and embraced by. Uh, you know, uh, artists and, and, and stars. And so I, I think this idea that the creative process moves more to the end point and becomes almost a end consumer guided uh, process in the future is, is you're, you're seeing it unfold. And I think Minecraft in the early days had a lot to do with, um, you know, just a, how you could cre basically create your own game experience, right? And your own game outcomes, right? You were able to actually you know this kind of first generation and you're seeing that be continued now and uh i do think that'll play a role as you know we talked about this convergence of what you play and what you watch if you think about that in the context of this i i, I think these all come together and i think the you know the creator economy really really shifts this focus right where it's uh you know much more managed by the consumer which i which i think is uh an incredible tr tr transition if you will yeah, I would I would add to that. I, I and I'm a huge fan of of those formative kinds of gaming experiences between Minecraft and Roblox. And it's not a not a far jump to go from building your environment in your house in Roblox to imagine building the next version of some new planet in in Unreal Engine. It's you know these you're conditioning people to think about the possibility that I'm an active involved actively involved in the story, which is a wonderful idea. Well, the future is an exciting thing, and uh, I'm assuming that you're all counting yourself quite fortunate to be not just involved with it, but actually helping to deliver it. So that really brings us to the end of our podcast today. It's been fascinating hearing uh, all of that insight and expertise uh, from you. Now, our very own little slice of recorded media, this MP3, uh, is going to go and get processed in the cloud somewhere, probably, and then we'll um, throw it up into our s3 instance and it'll disappear off to multiple endpoints uh, via rss feed if you'd like to dig into uh, a bit more on this topic outside of this audio then do come along to digitalbulletin.com where you'll find some editorial and video featuring um, at least two of our guests are on, on the podcast today in the form of frank and surrogate plus others uh, but in the meantime until next time goodbye